You are connected, and you are listening to Specifically for Seniors, the podcast for those in the Remember When generation. Today's podcast is available everywhere you listen to podcasts and with video at Specifically for Seniors YouTube channel. Now, here's your host, Dr. Larry Barsh. Today on Specifically for Seniors, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Lawrence Gartell. Lawrence has been called the father of digital art. He created his first artworks on an analog video computer. His work has been displayed at MoMA, the Norton, and in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of American History. He's had associations with Debbie Harry, Ace Freely of Kiss, and Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols. Lawrence taught Andy Warhol to use his Amiga computer. He's created artwork for Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and famously for Absolute Vodka. He's created art cars, the first being a Tesla in 2010, and he was the only artist to be featured in the series of Think Different ads by Apple. Welcome to Specifically for Seniors, Lawrence. It's great to have you on. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm glad we finally connected after a disconnect, which happened because my Gmail didn't work. So, you know, this proves that you need to have multiple platforms in order to get your point across. So yeah, I'm but, happy for that. But AOL, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah. before we even get started mm. in, in doing my research for this, I want to hear the story about Sid Vicious Party that you missed. Well, OK, so that's the first topic of discussion. So, you know, growing up in New York City in the 70s and 80s was a very, very monumental time. And I do have to say that I missed Woodstock by a year because I was only 14. If I had been 15, I would have been on in a car, on a bus, whatever. I would have been there. But I was just a little too short of going, being a little too young. And uh so I went to the High School of Music and Art in Harlem, and music and art was always a synergy and always a connect. So uh, in saying that, we used to go to Max's Kansas City, CBGB's, Studio 54, uh, the Red Parrot, uh, the Tunnel. I could name tons of places that were incredible places to go in New York at that time. And this is when the birth of punk rock came in. So I used to go to Max's and CBGB's and Mud Club and, uh, and all these bands like the Ramones and um, the Dead Boys and the Sex Pistols, of course, were always playing and performing at these places. And it was like the beginning. So not like today where there's social media and more importantly, attitudes and annoyance in people's holier than thou kind of um, platform that they try to get over on people like the Kardashians, I'll say, or something like that. People were just artists. They were just musicians. They had something to say and they wanted to say it. And the people came to see them. And so I used to go to these places all the time and struck up conversations. I was a photographer or a budding photographer, I'll say. And um, I used to get friendly and I used to talk to all these people. And uh, Steve Bader's, actually, the Dead Boys, invited me over to the Chelsea Hotel to do a photo shoot with him. And uh, that was quite interesting. And so I spoke to Sid one night and Sid said to me, listen, um, you know, 
let's do a photo shoot back at at the Chelsea. And I said, absolutely, because I had been there already before. So it's familiar. And um, but being the kid that I was, I got up late. And I said, oh, my God, it's late. I got I better call the hotel and, you know, tell Sid I'm going to be late. I was always late back then in those days. And there's a message to that, by the way, as well. <laughs> so I called the hotel and nobody had a phone in their room. You had to go through the front desk. So I called the front desk and it sounded like a London gentleman. And I said, can you please... Uh, tell Sid that I'm going to be late. And he said to me, point blank, don't bother coming. He just slashed Nancy to death. <laughs> and that was in room 100. And 35 years later, I actually threw a party in the basement of the Chelsea Hotel to honor the fact that I didn't make it to Sid's room. And so that's kind of an interesting thing, an interesting place to start. Why? Because the moral of the story was never be on time. Because look what happened to those poor people in 9-11 that said, oh, my God, I got to get to work. What about the guy that slept late? And said, you know, what? Oh, I'm going to like go in later on. You know, if he had been on time, he would have been most likely involved in that horror story and that tragedy. So there's something to say about not showing up. So like not showing up at the right time, I could have been stabbed. I could have been dead. I could have been killed. And so uh, I always take it as a good omen. The same thing like uh, the big bopper. Right. And uh and Dion has like, you know, like remorse of never getting on that plane and all his friends did and they all were killed. So he didn't show up. He didn't go and he survived because of it. So there's there's an interesting story with being late. So that was, that was a great way to get people to know you a little better, too. Yes. Uh, back to business for a sec. Yeah. What is what's an analog video computer? What is it? Well, basically, it has to do with RCA jacks and voltage control and things that are being uh, translated utilizing a system. And I guess I didn't send you a photo of it, uh, of my setup or not. I should have. I didn't. Um, if you hang on one second, I will show you. Stand okay. by. Stand by. Okay. So you've reached me in Atlanta today. I'm in my hotel room. I'm here for the toy fair. And uh, because I created the number one selling toy in the world called Shishibo. And that's another story. But let me just go to my book, which is called Warhol versus Gartel Hip Hop. It's a 300 page book uh, produced by the Luca Museum in Italy. And in here is a picture of my analog computer system. Ah, nice, compact, pocketable. Yeah. Correct. Your phone can do more than what this system did. But here's the great thing. See this screen right over there? I photographed that using a camera on a tripod and photograph the images in order to capture them because there was no way to save an image at all. The only way was to take a still photograph. Right. So you can see the knobs, the buttons, the wires, and they all did something. And there was like this board on the, on the blue side over there. I don't know which is left, which is right, but, um, so you patched in wires and they went to this router and depending on how you uh, manipulated it, it changed an image in gray values. So you were able to alter it. And that's right. pretty much what a analog system computer did. In my other book, my first book in Italy, not my first book, but my book published in Italy called Gartel Art and Technology, where... Here's the Think Different ad that you spoke of. I'm sorry for the 
Yeah, I have another picture yeah. of it. We'll show later. Yeah. So in here is some early. Uh, this is really surely a great book because, uh, and it's out of print and it's out of stock. I can't even sell it to you. But um, there are early works in here. 1978. There's a piece in here. 1976. So how many years ago is that? 40. A long time ago. Enough. <laughs> Enough years Enough. ago. There it is. 1976 at the bottom. My friend Kevin at the top. Right. All done on those system on that system that you just saw. Remarkable. Remarkable, right? Here's another one. So those were in the early days. And like, you know, the, the story is so big. I'm actually trying to make an encyclopedia out of my, my work. And it's going to be 500 pages, three volumes, 1,500 pages. But every day I'm doing something else. And so it's hard to, like, work on the book. I wish I were – well, I shouldn't say I wish because uh, be careful what you wish for. I was going to say I wish I were retired so I can work on it. But I'm not retired. I'm, I'm as active today as I was day one, hour one. And uh, I have those images, believe it or not, day one, hour one. That really? means the first day that I walked into a computer system, they said, all right, try it out. And I didn't know what I was doing with, the, with that system that you saw. And I was just fumbling around, but I took photos off the screen of what I did and I printed them. And I have these uh, six by nine prints. I have a dozen of them of my first day, my first hour, which is remarkable. Do they look good? They, yeah. You know, but they are what they are, and that's what makes them very special. Well, I mean, comparing to uh, photos today, yeah, uh, there's quite a... My first computer was an Osborne portable. Okay, 40, yeah. 40 pounds. Sure, of course, an Osborne. Sure, I remember it well. I said to my wife, you can get 15 pages of type on just one disk. Wow. That how was a big you, deal. How do you define digital art? Well, first of all, you have to be a digital artist to make art. So it's from the maker, not the, not the uh, you know. And then there are some people that uh, program a computer uh, there was a guy named uh, Harold Cohen who made this drawing machine in the 80s, and the, and the machine drew, but he programmed it. So people would say, well, that's not art because like, or if an elephant steps on ink and steps all over a piece of paper and they say, look, the elephant made art. Art is something created by man that has a human plan. That is the definition of art. Art created by man that has a human plan. That is art. Now, the quality of that art, that's open for interpretation. And so that's how I define it. It's like, how good is it? It's, uh, is it good enough for you? Is it good enough for me? Is it good enough for... You know, who's the judge of that? I mean, everybody has a level where they judge art and uh, and they're entitled to their opinion, by the way, just like everyone is about everything else. We live in a free world or where, you know, I thought we did. And um, and I think because of that, uh, uh, I define it basically as art that was made using a computer. That is what digital art is. Good, bad, or ugly. How's that? Uh, I I hate being told what I should like. Yeah, well, that's up to you. That's up to you. I hate reading the little cards in a museum mm. because I don't want the curator's opinion of what the art is. Yeah, because I'm the one looking at it. I would totally agree with you, except that. Sometimes a didactic on the wall will give you more information than you had before in order for you to judge it, not to say this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I got to tell you a really interesting thing, being that you brought that issue up. 
um, I took a photograph. It's actually on my Facebook of uh, the sky going into Georgia. And I was thinking of Ray Childs uh, when I was uh, taking the photograph. And then I looked more carefully at it. And, and uh, uh, the sky, and, and I have it set up so it takes a full frame on the, on the uh, phone. And it's a fantastic image. It's huge. And um, I look at the sky and it looks like a Mark Rothko painting. And I'm thinking to myself, why is Mark Rothko worth $40 million as opposed to the photograph that I just took? So that's a question that I'm going to leave somebody else to answer, not myself. Um, however, you know, um, Mark Rothko died a tragic death of committing suicide and his paintings got darker and darker. And he was a very religious man, by the way. And so, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, again, it's, it's up to the viewer to put a value on what art is and the value of that art. If you think it's worth $40 million and you have it, um, be my guest. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, I don't know if I would buy a Rothko if I had $40 million, to be honest with you. I might buy something else. One of mine? Possibly. Okay. I'll uh, talk to you after the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you start getting interested in art? Well, I, I have formal art school training. I started at the age of nine. I went to the Pell School of Art in uh, downtown uh, 70, 73rd Street and Broadway in the old Ansonia Hotel. And, um, but I've since changed my story. I now say I got interested in art in my mother's womb by drawing with my own fluid, with my unfinished finger as to what I was doing. And I think I was always an artist. I was born an artist. Interesting. You, you started a new form of art. Yeah. When you went to a museum, to show yeah. your work. Was it accepted? Absolutely, positively, 100% not. And, and because people didn't know what it was and nobody wants to bet on something that is new and unique. And I was once interviewed by, uh, I believe his name was Sokolov of the uh, NYU Gray Gallery. And this is because in 19, I forgot what year it was, uh, 88, I think. Um, he said, well, digital art has no value and it really has no future. And that was when I was commissioned to do the cover of Forbes. It was the first digital art Forbes ever used. Now, when you think about it, because of the printing industry, absolutely everything is now digital art. And I was working with a film festival, it was called the Future Film Festival of Bologna in Italy. They commissioned me to do their announcement in 2000. It was uh, the second cover or second image that they asked me to do. The first one was somebody local, an Italian, and the second one was they went directly to me. and. The idea about that was because their festival was digital and it was a digital festival with using technology in order to make things. And she just, just made an announcement because we keep in touch and she actually just had a retro exhibit of all the uh, past 20 years worth of uh, art for that festival. And she just wrote, we can't call it this anymore. It is a 360 degree uh, festival because all of filmmaking is now digital. Everyone uses technology. You can't say that one film doesn't, everyone uses it. So it went from nothing to something in a span of 20 years. It is everywhere. 
news for everything. Uh, digital art is in the world for every single person to use. How you use it, that's up to you. Okay, let's, because I don't think many people know your work that well, at least okay. in my uh, <laughs> sphere. No, I don't think anyone really, you know, I, I will tell you, I've met a few people along the way that said, Mr. Gartell, you changed my life. I was directionless. I saw your book written by Namjoon Pike called Lawrence Gartell, A Cybernetic Romance. That was in 1989. You changed my life because I, I when I saw that book, and I said, I have hope. I have a future. I can do something. And this has gone on for the last 40 years. So there is always people that don't know, that haven't seen it, or maybe they saw it and they didn't know what it is for that matter. Well, I'm sure so, they, let's look at a couple of pictures. Hmm. So that's very interesting and that's very telling because I'm talking to you from Atlanta right now. And this was for the Coca-Cola Atlanta Olympics in 1996. And they commissioned me to do artwork for their marketing and promotion and merchandising of Coca-Cola in 1996. So what's interesting about this is that there were not art directors, but there were seven attorneys that looked at the work and had to uh, uh, yay or nay the imagery that I created. So. This image is very complex. Why? Because the pictures behind the Coca-Cola, the abstraction, okay, was created on those analog system computers that you showed earlier, and they were taken off the screen with Polaroid SX-70s. Imagine photographing a screen with a Polaroid camera. You had an instant result. So that background comes from a piece that is comprised of, uh, I think I would have to add it up, how many high by how many wide, but there's probably 200 Polaroid photographs in the background of that Coca-Cola. And the whole idea was that when you drink a Coke, it's an experience. And that's what the artwork uh, conveyed. Okay, let's look at something else. Okay, so this is now um, the 10th anniversary of the Fort Lauderdale International Film Festival. And again, you know, my medium is time. I use time as an element in my work. And funny enough, that that uh, marquee is from the Gateway Theater on Sunrise Boulevard. And I was just there and I saw Top Gun, of all things, in that, in that theater a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so uh, Reservoir Dogs was in there. A couple of the movies that were up for Academy Awards that year are in that particular poster. So, yeah, that's what that was. Ah, so I make art cars, and this was, uh, I called this car the love car. It's a 1956 Cadillac Sedan DeVille, and there are angels all over the car. And um, uh, we had to replace, I think, the back seat at one point, and um, they found a card from the governor of Tennessee, and his daughter actually dated Elvis. So they started to make up a story how Elvis actually kissed his daughter in the back seat. Is but, is that a wrap or is it painted on the car? No, I don't paint. I've been digital since 1975. So that is a digital image printed to vinyl and adhered to the car using heat. I've done 65 cars in my career. Wow. This one the next one has an interesting story. Ah, absolute cartel. Uh, yeah. You were, yeah. You, were, you were asked at one time why the vodka bottle was out of focus? Yes, that's right. So um, 
Yeah, the simple part of the story is that's another Polaroid. That's my famous Polaroid called Moe's Ocean, which was shown at the Museum of Modern Art in 1982. I was 25 years old. And MoMA showed this work and I said, you know what? It's my best work. I'm going to appropriate myself. And I took that image and I twirled it around and so on. And so the bottle's out of focus and and people would say to me, like, did you show this to Absolute? I said, well, I had to have in order to get approval. You know, and the reason why it's on the back of 300 million magazines from 1991 to 2001, Art in America, Art Forms, Sotheby's Wired, New York Magazine, uh, the list goes on. And they say, yeah, but it's out of focus. I said, well, if you drink enough vodka, yes, the bottle will go out of focus and the wobbliness of the background is going to be how you feel. So Absolute applauded this image and said, this is like one of our greatest images ever created for the campaign. And it actually was. That is so interesting from uh, an artistic point of view, uh, because many people, it's just the sharpness of the image. I see a lot of that in photography as well. Uh, if you have a photograph judged in a camera club, mm -hmm. uh, it's not sharp. This hair isn't distinct. Well, I didn't want it to be. And you get graded down. Interesting. Well, I've broken rules my entire life, Larry. Um, from the time that I ran away from summer camp swim time to go to the... Uh, general store in another town and then i'd come back and i'd uh, be selling cans of uh uh coca-cola and uh and uh all sorts of um, cupcakes and so on and i had a little black market going on and and they never they never caught me i, I actually paid someone off to take the rap so um you know uh, I, art is all about breaking the rules. That is exactly what art is. If you ever want to go anywhere in life, you have to break some rules. Uh, I'm not saying break laws. I just I, just <laughs> rules. Just rules. So uh, I say that because this picture uh, evokes a lot of that. So what's going on in this picture? It's a photograph that has been painted on. I used a, a 3D software program. I added that green hand that is somewhat uh, translucent uh, and it's Coney Island. And my famous picture called Coney Island Baby, which was my first image of a series, I said, oh, I'm gonna make a whole series of, of images like this. And I couldn't make a sister image, so I made a cousin, and I have a cousin series, and this is called Clown Cousin. So this is the first image, and this is 50 by 60 inches tall. That's a physical object. It's large. And um, it's a very compelling piece. A lot of people think that's Judy Garland, which it isn't, but it does look reminiscent. I've heard this like a million times and there's little stars in her eyes instead of the, the pupil there. You can like take a, if you, you know, zoom in, you could see that in the eyes there's are stars. Here's the picture we were talking about, the Think Different yeah. ad. Yes. So Steve Jobs commissioned this. I was working, you know, before Steve Jobs ever touched a computer. And so this was really rather interesting because I'm the only like at the time, this was in 1997, but Steve started that company in the late 70s and I was working in the mid 70s. And uh, I got to use the first Apple II computer and uh, felt that, you know, if anyone's going to have an ad like Gold of My Year, Jackie Robinson, Jim Henson, Gandhi, Picasso, and myself are some of the uh, luminaries who have had this Think Different ad. And uh, 
you know, clearly it uh, is is uh, good poetic justice for me working even better now because it's a very crowded room of people trying to do digital art. This guy was the first. And the famous Tesla. Uh, the Tesla car. This car, uh, I was commissioned to create this car to launch Tesla in 2010. And I did it during Art Basel Miami Beach at the uh, uh, nightclub down in Miami called Nikki Beach. And I drove this car around and it went viral to 25,000 websites at the time. People were taking photos of it, and Art Basel was kind of like getting started uh, a few years uh, prior, and this car was everywhere, and it made such an incredible impact. And they asked me, you know, to make an art car because they said, well, electric car, electric artist. It's the perfect combination. And I didn't know how to do it, but I figured it out, and, you know, if you do the same thing over and over again, you're going to get the same result. You got to like try to do things out of the box like the ads. You have to think different. And so this was thinking very, very different. Okay. Let's see if we can get us back to full size. Yep. Good. Um, you taught Andy Warhol how to use a computer? Yeah, that was in 1985, and I had met him at Studio 54, and he said, listen, I've got this commission uh, to do uh, Debbie Harry's album cover, and they very much wanted a uh, Commodore, that is, to uh, assist him in making it, and he should make it on a computer. And the thing about that, of course, was I was a kid. I didn't have the notoriety. I didn't have the... Uh, uh, the cachet and everything to be the featured artist, but I certainly could have helped him. And that's what I did. And so because I did that, uh, he, and he never touched the computer ever again. I mean, this was not his, you know, uh, bailiwick. This was not his expertise. So um, I showed him how to use deluxe paint and photon paint. And he, he tried to work a little bit with a mouse, whatever. And uh, there was a video camera that was um, put down of a photograph of Debbie Harry. And we played around, input it into the system. And that was that. Amazing. Amazing is right. Who, who, were, you, who were your idols in the artwork? Well, you know, I have a great story. My mother always uh, took me to the Guggenheim Museum all the time. And I looked at the work of Miro and Klee and Kandinsky. And uh, my mother would go, isn't that beautiful work? And I was like, it's all right, Mom. You know, my work is better. And she would give me a whack across the face. What are you talking about? You're at the museum. Of, uh, you know, the, the Guggenheim Museum, the greatest art is here. So, um you know, I grew up going to, to the Metropolitan Museum and seeing really wonderful works my whole life. I mean, I've been looking at art my whole life, and uh, it was inspiring. And more than that, my parents, uh, we lived in the Bronx at the time on the Grand Concourse, and I uh, facing uh, Joyce Kilmer Park, of all things, and the courthouse. And in our huge apartment with a drop down uh, living room, um, they had a table with a marble slab and on that table were books from the mat of uh, Monet Manet, which I still have by the way, and uh, Van Gogh and Picasso. And I would look at these books and they just took my breath away. I'm talking about a nine-year-old. And they took my breath away. And I said, I'm going to be as great as these guys. And I knew in my heart of hearts, Larry, that that was an almost an impossibility. That was the toughest, hardest. And I'm just a kid thinking this. But I set that out to be my goal. And that's what I did. That's the truth. 
Let me ask you a question that may be a little bit hard to answer. What goes on in your head when you're creating a piece of art? Do you, do you pre-plan these or do you just start working and see what happens? It depends what really, like, like my next project is I am making, I've gotten a commission to do somebody's boat. It's my first boat that I've ever done. So the guy says, uh, you know, do I have a say or what is, I said, yeah, of course you do. I'm going to, you know, but I have to tell you, every object has an alter ego. It will tell me what it wants to be. It will tell me it will be, that will be directing me. And he actually uh, went to the University of Southern California, USC. And, you know, as many filmmakers that went there and so on. And so I said, oh, do you want some cheerleaders in there? You know, and he goes, oh, I'd like a few cheerleaders if you don't mind. So like the cheerleader a concept to me had to turn into a mermaid. You know, so I made her a mermaid with the USC. And then like, you know, he said, you know, it really doesn't belong there. And I said, well, I, I think you're right. So, you know, that's sort of like how the process kind of goes and things like that, which is a commissioned work, you know. So um, people usually let me do my thing. But at the same time, the project itself uh, has a directive that I can't say uh, I'm working out sketches or this. Or, it doesn't, you know, like with the computer, I'll say that if you make a mistake, you can erase it. Although I have to be honest and say I've never made a mistake. <laughs> what I do, what I do always gets put down and I don't erase it. But it would be interesting to make a piece and then erase it. I mean, that's that's a whole nother, that's a whole new concept because, you know, that um Bansky. The fan, the fan, forget Bansky. I, I'm talking about uh uh Robert Rauschenberg erasing a de Kooning in 1955. Was it 55 or 59? I mean, that is a real story how he got him a piece and he erased it. That, that, that that's like the greatest story of all time in art history, you know. So Erasing a piece is rather an interesting uh, sort of concept in the digital age. I've not I've not tried that, but I think it would be rather interesting uh, as an idea. But, you know, my latest thing. So moving forward to my like present time is that during COVID. Um, I created something which uh, is rather interesting. And I and I have a couple of examples here. This is called Shishibo shape-shifting box and what it does is you can make all sorts of shapes this is digital art in three dimensions is what this is and it's in every barnes and noble in the united states it's also and on amazon it's also on I amazon it's the number one selling uh toy puzzle uh on amazon uh today and Here's a real sneak preview. This is not out yet. These are new, brand new cubes, but one cube actually can go into another. So the more you have, the more you can make. And we say collect and connect. The shapes can connect together. It's it's really quite a, an amazing thing. Digital art. Digital art in three dimensions done in a new and unique way that's never been done before. That is what I try to do every single time is to top myself and to reach back. For, because if you think about a Lichtenstein painting, you know, I, listen, I, I think his work is magnificent. I admired it. I, I said to myself when I was younger, how am I ever going to be that perfect? Because a Lichtenstein painting is painted perfectly. How can I do that? And I said to myself, Lawrence, you'll never be that perfect. You can't do that. You have to do something else. And so, uh, you know, that's the evolution of digital art for me. And I'm still trying to come up with new ideas and new situations and scenarios where the digital art is transformed. I like the idea of transforming things. So 
So think different really applies to you. A hundred percent. Yes. I, I say that to myself every day. So uh, two weeks ago, I just launched a very exclusive clothing line in Paris, menswear. And so it got an amazing reception and we're working on the second collection now, which will be ready. This is, of course, fashion always is like a year, 18 months out into the future. And, uh, you know, so we'll be seeing it in some exclusive places like the Breakers, for instance, would be a great place for this kind of collection of clothing to be. But it's been uh, revered in the uh, Maldive Ferry Islands with um, um, the Ritz-Carlton and in Helsinki and and other places around the world that uh, – people can find exclusive clothing and resorts. It's really the target audience for that. So that's... Lawrence, this has been great. I'm glad. Thank you so much for having me. What else would you like to say? No what question. Can... Just go ahead. What can I say? What can I say? Enjoy your life because it goes by so goddamn fast. I, I can't believe it. I, I think you have to enjoy every minute, every moment, do things that make you happy, try to make other people happy. That's tougher than anything else is trying to make other people happy. You know, I don't know why, but that seems to be a very difficult task to do. So uh, I have a personal trainer that I'm working with for the last year on like losing weight, diet and exercise and that sort of stuff. And uh, he said something very profound to me today. And he said, you're the pilot of a plane that has one passenger. Make sure it flies well. Isn't that just, I, 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 you know, it's just. Beautiful. Uh, yes, I would say. So I invited you to my upcoming exhibition at the Box Gallery at 811 Belvedere Road in West Palm Beach on September 3rd. And your, your audience, I guess they're more than welcome to come uh, via you. I guess I should, uh, they should say Larry sent me, meaning you. <laughs> and uh, uh, that'll be a very interesting show because that exhibit, is called Gartel Media Blitz Palm Beach. And it is all about promotion of art. The posters that I've created, the books, covers that I've done, magazine articles. Uh, it's not about seeing new work or things that you could, again, judge, you know, like you said. Uh, this is not about judging. This is about promotion of uh, of an artist's work. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see how people respond to that. But everything's for sale, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Just by the way. By the way. That's by right. The way. Mm. Lawrence, thanks for coming on. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you it's, for having me. It's been great. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Uh, thank you so much. If you found this podcast interesting, fun, or helpful, tell your friends and family and click on the follow or subscribe button. We'll let you know when new episodes are available. You've been listening to Specifically for Seniors. We'll talk more next time. Stay connected.